Good morning, everybody. I'm just going to give everyone a couple of minutes to, to come through and we'll do um, introductions and get going. Okay, um, so welcome everybody um, and good morning. Um, today our webinar or webinar is called Back to the Future and it's all around hybrid working. Um, so my name is Deirdre Moore and I'm the, WAM, the Senior WAM Project Officer here at AHEAD. Um, and we're delighted to have so many people attending this morning. Before we kick off, I'm just going to go through a couple of things um, around accessibility in, uh, in the webinar. So Jade, I might get you to move to the second slide, please. So there is captioning available for all attendees who wish to use, uh, use these during the webinar. Um, so they're the subtitles and you can access that by um, clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Um, my colleague Jade uh, Dyer is here today with us and Jade joined the head team last week. So we're excited to have her on board the WAM team. So welcome Jade. Um, she'll be sharing links and other information in the chat box and she'll also be keeping an eye on the Q&A feature. So the Q&A feature, we encourage you to use that for any questions you might have throughout the session and in particular for the different pre presentations we're doing today. Um, and we'll, we'll answer those at the end of the presentations. Um, you can use the chat box to let us know um, where you're tuning in from today. Um, and if you've any kind of um, want to make any comments or want to engage with the audience, um, you can do that there. Um, if you're um, following us on social media today, you can hashtag um, Waminar. And just to note that all the slides and um, the presentation slides and the links will be sent to all the attendees after the event. Um, okay, so we've got 161 people registered for the event today. Um, so we just want to get a sense who of who's in the audience this morning, and we're going to launch a, a quick poll. So Jade, if you don't mind sharing, stop sharing your screen and uh, share the poll. So we're just getting a sense of the sector and background you're coming from. So the first question is um, to select which is which option is most appropriate to you. I work in HR, I'm the designated disability access officer, I'm a hiring manager, I'm a line manager, or I'm a regular employee. And the second question is, what sector do you work in? So the public or private sector. Um, while Jade is launching that poll, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the WAM program. So many of you um, may be new to, to the WAM program. So for those of you engaging with us for the first time, HEAD works to create inclusive environments in education and employment. We've been around since 1988 and the WAM program, or WAM for short, is a project of a HEAD that's been around for the last 16 years, so since 2005. Um, the WAM program is funded by the Department of Social Protection, and we work with employers who ring fence um, paid and mentored roles for graduates with disabilities um, for a minimum of six months. And more recently, we have um, lots of roles that are kind of 12 months or two year, two year contracts as well. To date, we've placed over 550 graduates with disabilities and about 80% of our graduates have secured full-time employment as a result of their placement upon completion. So that's a little bit about the WAM program. So we might end the poll there and share the results, please. Um, okay, so we have um, about 36% of the audience are regular employees. 28 are a designated disability or access officer, 25% work in HR, and then the other um, groups are line manager 8% and hiring manager 4%. And in terms of the sector that you're dialing in from or tuning in from, 60% are the public sector, 21% private employers, and 11% higher ed, and then we've about 6% from not-for-profit. So welcome everybody. Um, so this morning's webinar is um, 
this morning's webinar is around hybrid working. So since January, I suppose there was an announcement that workplaces could begin to return to on site. Uh, and with that announcement, there came lots of, I guess, questions, um, concerns, having to make plans locally and teams, but also across the wider organization. So the WAM team, I suppose, were also starting to plan around going back to um, on-site work for our graduates and for our employee employers. So we felt this was a timely time to talk about um, this topic. We are joined today by Sea Change. Um, so Sea Change um, are doing a lot of work in the mental health space and breaking down stigma but in particular, they have been, um, I suppose, focused in on the return to work post COVID and the impact that that can have on people's mental health and well-being. So we are joined today by Sea Changes Programme Teams Coordinator, Barbara Brennan, and she's going to talk a little bit around the well-being of all employees returning to work. So we're going to start with her presentation in a couple of minutes, and you'll have an opportunity to ask Barbara some questions at the end of the presentation. And then we'll be following that with a presentation from myself and my um, manager, Caroline McGrotty, um, on the learnings from the WAM program over the past two years. Um, so we're excited to share our learnings and in particular some insight from a focus group of graduates with disabilities um, that were on placement with um, WAM employers over the past two years. Um, so I guess I'd like to introduce uh, Barbara. So Barbara, if you wouldn't mind putting on your camera, please. Um, so Barbara, thank you very much for joining us this morning. I know Sea Change and Barbara in particular are a supporting um, friend of AHEAD and of the WAM program. And um, Barbara is, um, is the program, sorry, the program coordinator at Sea Change. Barbara, would you like to introduce yourself and we'll get you then to share your, your screen and um, get on with your presentation, please. Absolutely, thank you so much. And um, as you say, it's wonderful to have a conversation about returning to work because so many of us are in such different scenarios at the moment. Some of us are returning to work for the first time in a long time. Some of us are the ones who've been in an office and we're experiencing other people returning. Some of us are returning in that hybrid way. So there's lots of different variables and that's before we put the lens of disability on that. So it's really, really interesting and really timely to have this conversation. So I'm going to share my slides, talk a little bit about who we are and what we do and then uh, relate it back to the conversation. So um, hopefully this will work okay. So we'll, um, okay, so um, so who we are, I suppose, to, to start um, the conversation and see a little bit about Sea Change and who we are and who I am and why I'm talking to you. So I'm the programs leader of Sea Change and Sea Change is the National Stigma Reduction Programme, which has been around since 2010. We are a project of Shine and I'm going to speak a little bit about them and their work in a moment. But for me, I suppose it's about understanding how people understand the topic of mental health and particularly the impact of stigma. So when we talk about stigma, what is that? What does it mean? And how does it impact people, particularly with lived experience of mental health difficulties? And when we're thinking about disability, it's the fact that most people who experience a disability will also experience a challenge to their mental health at some point as well. So I'm very interested in having those kind of conversations. For me, it's about also understanding what we can do. So while um, I am the programmes leader of Sea Change and I do an awful lot about having different conversations, it's also coming from my own lived experience. I experienced um, a suicide attempt that put me on life support back in 2008 after 15 years of severe and long-term uh, complex mental illness. And so really for me, getting better was never an option. I didn't know. I didn't know that people can and do recover. I didn't know that people can and do hold down jobs and have very normal lives until it happened to me. And so that's why I am so passionate about sharing information about mental health in general, breaking down the stigma around um, mental illness and really understanding how we can all make a difference. So as part of that, I mentioned that we are a pro program of Shine. So Shine supports people affected by mental ill health. And when I say affected by mental ill health what I mean is everybody because first of all we all have mental health and secondly when we think about somebody who is affected by mental ill health it's not just the person experiencing the mental health difficulty but also their families and the people who support them as well so for example we do have peer-to-peer -peer groups we have um 
a lot on recovery building for individuals who are rebuilding their lives after experiencing mental health difficulty. And we also have family supports as well. We have centres in Dublin, Cork and Waterford, and we have resource offices around the country. Shine has been in existence since the 70s, so it's a long time doing the work that it does. And about 15 years ago, it started looking at the barriers to people accessing the supports, like some of the ones that they provide. And they found that stigma, this idea of prejudice and discrimination, was impacting people in such a big way that it was a barrier to accessing those supports. And essentially, that's where Sea Change was born. On the screen, you'll also see Headline, that is our sister program and that really looks at supporting journalists so it's the idea of um, education from the first instance so that journalists can report responsibly on mental illnesses and also on suicide particularly but also there is a media monitoring aspect there so it's about different conversations with the media so if you want to find more about what shine does or what headline or sea change does literally our websites are as you see them there so shine.ie headline.ie and seachange.ie for the different things that we do. So if you want to find out more, I'd suggest go to them and thank you to the guys for putting some of our links into the uh, chat there as well. And so we are on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn and Facebook as well. We are Seachange Ireland across our social media platforms. So now we'd really like to talk to you about today's topic and about what it is that we are looking at when we start thinking about mental health and we start thinking about mental health and stigma and what is that. So when we say mental health stigma, for the first part, when we think about mental health, quite often we jump to mental illness. And quite often when we jump to mental illness, what we make the assumption is that somebody is on heavy medications, that maybe they're in hospital, that they can't cope, that they can't function, that they aren't going to get better. So these are things that we have experienced over the years through um, things that we have heard, things that we've seen or read. And a lot of these things are actually myths because people can and do recover. And I've, I've mentioned that I've witnessed that in my own life. Particularly when we look at stigma, we need people to understand what that is because we're starting to understand that there is an impact on people. And there's two different kinds of stigma and people can experience both. So when we talk about stigma itself, what we're talking about is public stigma. This is when stigma is done to you. So somebody um, will experience being discriminated against or being treated with prejudiced attitudes or you know they may um they may have somebody exclude them from something because of their mental health difficulty that is direct stigma that is done to you so that's what we call public stigma the other one is self-stigma so this is where i do it to myself and so really how we understand that is when we look at the behavior. So for example, if I was to say that I had been struggling with my mental health and a number of people in my locality knew it, and I went to the supermarket and I saw two of my neighbors and neither of them spoke to me. At that moment in time, maybe I'm making the assumption that they don't want to uh, talk to me because I have a mental health problem or because they know that I'm going through something difficult. Obviously, I can't know what somebody is thinking, but this idea of self-stigma, it's telling me they think that you're bad or you're wrong or there's something, something wrong with you. And they don't want to talk to you because of that and because they're afraid of you and maybe they think you're dangerous or maybe they think you can't cope. So they, they don't really want to get in, into that conversation. So maybe I'll go home and then the next time I want to go to the supermarket, I'll say, actually, I don't want to go to the supermarket because I might run, in, run into those people and I don't want to experience that again. So I'm just going to stay home. So now I start isolating myself. I start um, changing conversations that I'm having with people, maybe not engaging more. So now I am creating behavior myself because of my perception. The thing is that until we start having conversations, we don't actually know whether those people intended it. Maybe they were just busy. Maybe they were focusing on something. Maybe they actually wear glasses and they hadn't got them on at the time and they didn't see you because of the distance. There's lots of things that we make these assumptions about that we shouldn't. So when we're talking about this, we're talking about negative labels we're talking about identifying as different in a negative way we're talking about our history so when we think about you know when somebody became mentally unwell 50 years ago or slightly beyond that 
people were taken out of the community and put into institutions and quite often we didn't hear from them again or if we did there was whispers around the community of you know oh, she's not she's not well and you know um, or she's been to the she's been to the house on the hill or she's been to the, the hospital over the road you know she's not all there these kind of things we are aware of those being said thankfully not so much anymore but we still have this idea that if somebody experiences a mental health difficulty or are diagnosed with mental illness that that's the end of their life and that they're not capable of anything after that which is absolutely untrue so really what we want to look at we want to look at where does this come from and the facts around it so we've done a little bit of research in the last number of years and one of the things that we found in our most recent research is that 50 percent of us would actually conceal whether we had a mental health difficulty and this is from our family and friends from the people that we love that we live with that we work with that we care for and that care for us we would hide that and this is the thing so this is really what stigma is because stigma creates silence and it creates a void and this idea of shame and having to hide ourselves so it's not it's not now looking at how do i get help for my illness or how do i talk about my illness but now this idea of i can't show any symptoms of this illness at all i have to hide it completely so now we've got this mask on. And I know for many people, when we think about mental health experiences or mental illnesses, this idea of a mask is quite often gone to. And it's because of that stigma. It's that fear around the myths and the misconceptions, this fear of being treated differently, the fear of being labeled. And this is the thing when we talk about a label, quite often when we talk about labels to do with stigma, they don't go away. So, for example, if I had told you at the start of this presentation that I'd broken my leg back in 2008, you probably would be wondering why I was telling you that, because it's so long ago. Most people don't really consider the impact of things in our lives. But yet, when I tell people that I survived suicide and I was on a life support machine for a week, they don't tend to forget that. And the thing is that maybe knowing that information, they may think something different about me or about my capacity and capability because of that. And yet in my life it has been the driver for me to learn more to learn about resilience and to put things in place so that I don't ever go back there again and that's the thing that we really need to get to because actually the majority of people who experience mental health difficulties are incredibly resilient because not only are they dealing with life and not only are they dealing with stresses and strains of the, and the normal things they then have this extra hidden illness on top of that and then we're adding this shame and this stigma and everything else and layering and layering and layering so wouldn't it be wonderful if we could remove that stigma around it and that's really what we do at Sea Change it's about looking at what does that mean and what is it so when we talk about what we can do because we all can do something it's about educating ourselves so what is mental health stigma and you know I hope that I found a little bit of information to share with you there but you will find more from a lot of our guides and um, so I'm going to share with you three that you will be able to find on our website so we have the mental health matters guide this is particularly a bit stigma in the workplace we have the what is stigma guide this was a 2017 research that we did looking at the topic of stigma and then we have our newest guide stand up to stigma which we only launched last month so this talks a lot about the things that we're talking about here, stigma and discrimination and labeling and prejudice and how we can get into that unknowingly sometimes. And most often people do stigma to others without meaning to or even without knowing to, because here's the thing, I've been working in this area for 12 years now and I have yet to go on a course or to find a course that teaches people how to do stigma to somebody. And yet people are still dying every single year because they are fearful of sharing that they have a mental health difficulty and they don't get the help they need. So the thing that we can do is we can educate ourselves, find out about what, what challenges people face, what kind of discrimination is there. If, if, if I might discriminate about somebody unknowingly, what that might look like. So, you know, this idea of not having a conversation with somebody for fear of saying the wrong thing. Most often that's why we don't have these conversations because we're afraid of upsetting somebody or saying the wrong thing. But wouldn't it be better if we said, I'm afraid of saying the wrong thing and then going into the conversation and asking this person for their opinion and what they might like the language to be used because it is really important that we ask a person their experience we ask how they are feeling and about listening to their story it's why we have two of those and one of those because we should listen twice as much as we speak when we're talking about active listening this is really about validating the person's experience even if we don't know what it's like it might even be acknowledging 
thing for them. That must be really hard for you. Or I can't imagine what that's like. Tell me about that. So really giving that person space to have their conversation and explain to you what it's like can really help us understand stigma in a very different way. And particularly thinking about the language that we use, that's one of the biggest things that we do. So again, that stand up to stigma guide will really help you to understand the kind of language that we use and some of the kind of words that maybe we should be more mindful of. So particularly when we started experiencing the pandemic, for example, there was an awful lot of people saying things like crazy down in the supermarkets, absolutely mad down there, you know, or it's mad busy at work. We do this all the time and we regularly use language like that without considering what we are saying, why we've said it, the impact that it's gonna have on somebody else, or more importantly, what other words we could use instead. So the thing is that when we say that, so let's say I'm saying it's crazy down in the shop, I'm doing a couple of things. First of all, most likely, when I say crazy, it means that it's out of control and out of my control. So maybe in that moment, I might feel slight muscle tension, my breathing might change, I might feel something in my stomach, I might feel a little bit uncomfortable. And the thing is, I probably won't even notice that I'm going to talk about stress and anxiety in a moment in a little more so we can understand how that impacts us. But when we use those words, we start looking at the impact that our language has. So if I use the word crazy physically, it impacts me, whether I know it or not. And the second thing is the person I'm speaking to. Maybe they have experienced a mental health difficulty and maybe they were considering talking to me about it. But if they hear me using stigmatizing language like that, Maybe they're now going to say, I'm not sure she's the safest person to talk about because, you know, this is this is something really big for me. And I don't know if she's going to hear me the same way if she's throwing those kind of words into conversation. So it is about how do we have that conversation? What does it look like and how we can have different conversations, particularly looking at COVID-19 and our own mental health? There have been so many different things that have come up for us and really look at the fact that it's normal to experience anxiety it's normal to experience stress it's normal to feel like things are out of our control at the moment and they have been for some time so it's about at this point in time claiming back that piece of responsibility and control for our own lives and seeing what we can do when we think about returning to work which is really what we're trying to talk about today you know is this the first time that we're going out and going back into our workplace are we going back and using public transport is it maybe you know you've been in the workplace and now more people are coming back in so there's lots of things that we need to consider and one of the things that i would really urge you to do is to have a look at our covid 19 guide this one really talks about returning to the workplace and understanding different things so for example we have a whole section on stress and anxiety and it explains the difference between for example experiencing anxiety as opposed to having an anxiety disorder or mental illness diagnosed with anxiety. They're very, very different. Sometimes we might feel in the moment though that it is overwhelming and all consuming. So it's about what we do in those moments. So when we start thinking about stress then, so what is that? How does it show up and how do I know what to do with it? So when we talk about stress in general, it's a physical or emotional response to something, and usually it's to a threat. So when we think about going back thousands of years and we think about our ancestors, the cavemen, they would have experienced stress in a very, very different way than we do. So it's that fight or flight. Everybody knows that feeling. The thing is that fight or flight was in place to keep us alive. So if we were being uh, fearful of being attacked, let's say by a saber toothed tiger or a bear, or maybe another, or maybe another person who was trying to, you know, take our things or felt fearful of us, so we would have that fight or flight response. And when we think of fight or flight, what it does is either you freeze and you absolutely shut down. Or in that flight mode, what happens is lots of things happen in your body physiologically. So for example, your digestive, your digestive system shuts down. The reason being because you don't need to be digesting food or building your immune cells while you're in a state of fight. The other thing it'll do, you probably sweat more, you'll get tight muscles. And this is so that if you need to fight or run, that your body is primed for that. So you're gonna have the, the stress um, hormone cortisol absolutely flying around your body which is an amazing thing and it keeps us alive in those really dangerous moments. The thing is, jump forward now a couple of thousand years, we are having those same responses to very, very normal everyday things like 
when an email pings in that we are maybe not looking forward to, or we know we've, you know, we've got something that's the problem, or maybe sitting in traffic, or maybe we're late for something, or maybe we've had a row with somebody, or maybe that piece about anxiety and going to the supermarket that we're worrying about it, our body is responding in the same way. So the stress piece is usually the, the response to a threat. And it's about then how do we understand when it's normal and how do we understand how to take that back and what is it? And also what is the difference between stress and anxiety? So when we're talking about stress, we'll very much notice it in our body. So like I said, something like the muscle tension and um, fatigue, particularly because after a long period of stress, your body gets very tired from this fight or flight mode. When we think about our mind, we're going to think about all the things we're worrying about and the things that we've got going on and worry quite often will break our concentration. We'll have um, maybe um, mood differences. So you'll notice their irritability um, and particularly disturbances in our sleep and our eating patterns. We might also notice that we are looking for more sugar or maybe dependent on um, alcohol or substances and those kind of things because we're trying to flatten out this cortisol and this Thing that's going on in our body. What we can do when we're experiencing moments of stress is sometimes maybe taking a few moments out, writing it down, because also when we write it, when we write it down, we can then see it and it's minimalizing the size of it. We can then take steps to, to write a kind of pro and con list. What facts do I know about this? And what fiction do I know? Or what am I making assumptions about? And then we can move on to the action. So what thing can I do about this? So for example, let's say that I'm feeling an experience of fight or flight and that, that anxiety feeling in my body. I'm feeling irritable, I'm worried, and I'm feeling all the muscle tension and everything because I am late to an important meeting. In the moment when I'm sitting in the car and I'm, I'm late, obviously I can't write it down, but I can speak it out loud and things I can do or say, OK, I can't change the fact that I'm late. What are the things that I can do at the moment? It's not safe for me to make a phone call. So maybe I make a phone call when I get out or, you know, I can pull in somewhere safe and send a text or make a phone call to the person who's going to be waiting for me and let them know. Or maybe when I get there, I can just explain the situation and say, thank you for waiting for me. Because the truth is quite often, there isn't something we can do in that moment. So it's about understanding that when we get to that point, we have to take control back in a little way. We also can then visit our body. So for example, putting our shoulders down and taking a big deep breath. I know that we're often given this information and it feels really silly and it feels like in the biggest moment of stress and I'm panicking, taking a breath is going to help. Actually, it really does because going back to that fight or flight, when we're talking to that uh, caveman brain, it's trying to save our life. And in taking that breath and in trying to slow our bodies down, we're telling our body that it's safe, we're telling it that it's okay. So it's about giving our bodies those signals to help ourselves with that. So I want to talk a little bit about anxiety and how that's different from stress. So anxiety, when we start looking at it, it's this idea of feeling nervous, feeling afraid of something, something that we're fearful of. Particularly, so we've talked about what stress is, so we might notice that we have a heightened sense of stress. Some people say that it's a really heavy feeling in their body that they can't physically move in the same way, or they might even notice that jittery feeling. Some people also liken it to having too much caffeine. So if you've ever been somewhere really busy and you've had six or seven cups of really strong coffee and you get that kind of shaky feeling. Some people experience that kind of feeling just from anxiety when they are going through an experience like that. Um, again, that tension, that muscle tension that we go through, over catastrophizing things as well. So sometimes it's not just a regular worry, but it really builds into something huge that we can't get our head away from. And that idea of restlessness that no matter what we do, we can't move away and we can't change what we're doing. It really is important to look at the language that we use as well, because when we think about anxiety, it really is looking at describing fear that's being persistent over time. But it's also about our perception of what the fear is. So like I said, if we are feeling anxious and stressed because we are going to be late for a meeting, it's about changing our perception of the situation and understanding what we do have control of and what we can do. 
when we talk about workplace, because really, and I suppose the reason I want to talk about stress and anxiety is so that when we start experiencing some of those things as we return to our workplaces, that we're physically present in our bodies because our bodies tell us an awful lot. And it is about understanding some of those things before we add this extra layer. So some of the kind of things that we have on this list here are also in our COVID-19 guide. So again, there are a whole pile of challenges. And what we've done here is we've put the challenge on one side of the page and we've put the solution on the other. So some of the kind of things that we have listed here, as you can see, are things like having to touch things more often that maybe other people have. So how do I find out about that? Who's doing the cleaning or what can I do in addition to the cleaning that's being done? From a point of view of sharing the office spaces, you know, maybe the office space has completely changed. So maybe it might be helpful for you if you haven't been in that space to go back in and have a look at the changes that have been made and have a conversation with your manager or your colleagues to find out maybe have routines changed. Again, going back to that, um, that cleaning process and finding out what information you need to feel safe. When we think about getting back to face to face meetings and um, having a very different social aspect you know there's a little bit about um that social anxiety now and the, the kind of things that we will will experience like you know are we allowed to shake hands now how far is is a meter or two meters uh, you know what is this going to be like should i wear a face mask or shouldn't i what do i do if somebody comes in and they're wearing a face mask and i'm not you know there's lots of things that maybe we won't think of until we're in that scenario. And I think particularly when we think about things like the face mask, there are a lot of people getting anxious about that because they're thinking, well, you don't have to wear them anymore, but I feel safe for doing that. So for example, if we have a face-to-face -face meeting and somebody else comes in and they're wearing one and we're not, or vice versa, that we're wearing one and they're not, maybe the person who isn't wearing one could say to the other person, are you okay if I don't wear my mask? Or, you know, is it your preference that I put my mask on? Equally, we can ask people, would you mind, I'd feel safer if we did. So it's again about using our language and using our words to have these conversations instead of burying that. And the other thing that's so important is that we have so many changes to deal with at the moment. All of those layers I was talking about. It is so important that we recognise the physical aspect of these changes and how tiring it is. You know, we're also concentrating in a different way. And whether we're aware of it or not, again, going back to that stressor, we're all watching out for COVID. We're all watching out for, you know, making sure we stay safe. So that's going on in the background in everything that we do, whether we're aware of it or not. So be kind to yourself and be aware of the things that we are doing from a point of view of giving ourselves enough time to rest. If we're traveling, making sure that we give extra time just in case, or maybe we need to have a break by the time we get to work because we're exhausted from all the extra stuff that's going on and that we're having. So from a point of view of the different things that we can do, again, there are a number of things in our COVID-19 guide that you might find helpful and that um, discuss a couple of different things that you can do. But obviously, like I've already mentioned, if you find wearing a face mask is supportive to you and helpful to you, then do it. In the same way, we can all carry sanitizer. So just in case we get into work and the one there is empty, um, we can talk to our managers and our colleagues about the distancing and the hygiene and the different pieces that are in place. Again, um, taking time to get familiar with those surroundings and talking about it you know it's very very normal like for example i'm now back in the office a number of days since we since we have um opened things back up again and i don't particularly enjoy going to the canteen because there's numerous different organizations that use that same uh, that same canteen so either i make sure i go at a time when there's less people there or if a colleague would say to me, you know, come on and we'll go and get a cup of coffee. I might say, well, you know, thanks very much. I'll join you later. Or I don't really feel comfortable to do that with the amount of people in there. And that means that I'm just stating my case. It's not a big deal. It's not a big issue. And then other people understand and we're all on the same page. So it's really important to have that space to allow yourself to have those kind of conversations. And like I say, the extra times for, for tasks being done and giving yourself a little bit of space. This is so important. So if you are, whether it's that you're looking after yourself, whether it's that you're part of a team, whether it's that you are a parent or a partner or have anybody in your life that you need to do anything for, and it doesn't matter how big or small that thing is, you can't pour from an empty cup. So if you don't start doing your things to look after yourself and managing your stress and managing what you do and how you do it, there is absolutely you know way that you can support somebody else and the other beautiful thing about 
pouring from a cup that's full. It shows other people. So whether that's your colleagues, whether it's your friends, whether it's your family, you're leading by example and you're showing people these are the things that we can do. So, for example, like that, when somebody would say to me about going to the canteen and I'd say, actually, you know, I'm a little uncomfortable going in with all the people. But you know what? If you'd like to go in a half an hour when there's less people there, that would be fine. Or maybe we could get a cup of coffee and go outside and go for the walk. So now not only have I stated where my preference is, I've also stated a solution to what the issue is. So it's about putting those boundaries in place and feeling safe with your boundaries and also understanding that your boundaries are yours and they're there for you to use and protect and for them to protect you. And it's absolutely OK if other people have a different idea of what that should look like because it's your boundaries, not theirs. So maybe they have a different response and that's absolutely fine. But it's about looking at what do you need to do to take care of yourself as we're doing this? So when we're looking at in our workplaces and we're looking at our colleagues there's lots of things that we can do from that point of view so as a manager um, one of the things that i have done particularly in relation to covid19 is looking at clear direction so like we talked about earlier those discussions about changes that have happened in the office whether we're having face-to-face -face meetings even a simple thing to say actually going forward we're not going to shake hands but it's okay if you want to bump elbows but at least when we meet people we know that so looking at having those kind of conversations the reorientation again that, that's a piece about going into the building and maybe looking at the changes that have uh, happened and looking at what kind of information we need to share if any adjustments need to be made for a particular colleague that's about having a conversation to say, well, what's changed and what do you need? And is that reasonable for the organisation to provide? And how do we do that? Looking at your travel to and from work and the impact on that. And then really engaging in that self-care piece to make it part of your day, because it shouldn't be something that you just do on your own time. It is about taking your screen breaks. It is about drinking enough water. It is about engaging and maybe having a boundary in place about how many video calls you have. So, for example, on my team, um, we have a couple of rules in place about um talking on and blocking off that we have a distance between when we start and when a video starts and sometimes we have video free days as well because being online can be quite tiring in itself so again like that if we're going to be going back to in-person meetings maybe it's about monitoring your energy levels when you're having those meetings and particularly looking at how do we work well when we're um working from home and having those conversations, whether we're in the office or whether we're still remote about our experiences of returning to work. So I want to finish up thinking about conversation that we might have around language and this idea of perceptions that we have. So I mentioned earlier about self-stigma. So you can see there, there's a lady on the couch and she says, she didn't come over and say hi, she must have known that um, I've been having a tough time and not want to talk to me about it. So she's making the assumption that this other colleague doesn't want to talk to her because of a mental health difficulty. When in reality, we go over to the colleague and she's saying, so good to see you again. It's a shame I can't go over and hover to say hello because of the two meter distancing. So the thing is that when we think about the fact that we've been physically distant for so long, a lot of people have mistaken that for socially distant. So what we could do in that instance is, is to have that conversation. So maybe the colleague that's standing could say, you know, waving across the across the room and say, I'd love to hug you, it's a pity we can't because of this whole COVID thing. Have the conversation and don't be afraid. And really look at the kind of conversations that we can have about language. So again, I've mentioned those particular booklets. And really when I talk about the language piece, I think the uh, Stand Up to Stigma one does a beautiful, a beautiful job of really explaining some of the language that we have so it shows um myths and facts it shows things that show up but it also shows language examples and the same in the workplace guide that it has things like for example when we say commit suicide i think it's wonderful that we are talking about the whole topic of suicide more and that people are recognizing it and they're not as fearful to have that conversation however when we use the commit the word commit we're perpetuating that stigma because when we say commit people are not realizing that actually it was removed as a crime back in 1993 so that's quite some time ago and the thing is that also when we talk about commit it leaves it very separate because it's not a person 
it's something that happened out there and it's also really bringing this shame to the family as well so what we might say instead is that they died by suicide or that they took their life in the same way, I mentioned crazy earlier on um, when we were talking about going to the supermarket or that it's mad busy at work. So it's about looking at those small words that we can use and we can change. So I'd invite everybody to visit our website at seatchange.ie and have a look at our different guides. Um, just to let you know as well, we do have physical copies of these. So for anybody who would like one, you can send us an email at commsofficer at seatchange.ie or info at seatchange.ie and we would most happily post some out to you. So um, I believe I'm coming on time, so I am going to say thank you so much for your time and we would encourage you to engage with AHEAD in a very direct way and find out more about what they do, find out more about what Shine does and supports we can provide to you and engage with us. We also have a podcast where you can hear people's voices of uh, lived experience with mental health difficulties and that's on Spotify, on Anchor FM and on our website. It's the Sea Jane Sessions with Little Gail. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to your questions if you have any. Thanks a million, Barbara. Um, you're a fantastic speaker and you put it in, I suppose, a very practical and easy way to understand. And um, for me, I suppose, I've listened to you a few times over the last last while and that kind of, the, the way you describe that fear, that hesitation of people wanting to speak or about mental health or ask a person if they're okay. Um, I think it's important that people know it is okay to ask and, and you can't say anything wrong, I guess, once you're coming from a good place and and but in arming yourself with that good information and that education before so that if someone does disclose or if they're not in a good place you know kind of how to to respond then um okay. and this was the language piece as well is is really important um i know we in, in the wham team have been kind of uh, making big effort to change how we, we do talk um in particular about how busy work can be in the workplace Absolutely. And I think the other thing as well, to be very clear, when we're saying to people, have a conversation and ask people, what we're not saying is jump in and fix them. Yeah. And not yeah. saying you have to have all the answers. You certainly don't have to be a doctor or any of that. So if you really are considering supporting somebody with a conversation and if, for example, you think somebody isn't managing very well, one of the things you can do is that education piece, go and find out the supports that, that are available so that if you have that conversation, you might be able to say, well, for example, have you considered bringing the Samaritans? You know, and actually I rang them to find out what it was like and they were really nice. It was actually really easy yeah. to talk to. Or if we're in a workplace program, find out about the EAP, the Employee Assistance Program. You know, yeah. and know that they're going to ask you your phone number and what organization you work for so that they know who to bill and they have your conversation, have your phone number to have a conversation with in case could cut off. Those simple things can yeah. make a massive yeah. difference. And often be just speaking it out loud to the person and knowing there's someone listening and like you said, that active listening. In terms of, I suppose, there's we don't have any questions in the Q&A box, but if people feel comfortable, maybe popping them in the chat or if they want to um, come on on microphone, we can do that as well. But something I suppose we're hearing a lot of um, in the WAM program is that the working from home has been hugely beneficial for people's mental health and their well-being. So in particular, people that have diagnosed mental health difficulties and now that they are going back to the workplace, you know, you've come up um, with those amazing resources and guides. But for a person um, or an employee that is wanting i suppose to request that hybrid working arrangement or if their disability so for example if their um mental health difficulty has um heightened or it, you know they're experiencing more and uh, more symptoms or if they've acquired a mental health difficulty while they've been working at home what kind of tips would you give them on approaching an employer about that and and with the view i suppose to looking to work re um, remotely and on site well, I think there's a couple of things. So the first thing is about the reasonable accommodation. So when we say reasonable accommodation, it has to work from both sides. So for example, if my job was a person facing things, so for example, let's say I was doing one-to-one -one client work, I can't do that from home. So it may not be appropriate for me to request that hybrid working. But maybe in another role, if I don't have that one-to-one -one and it is possible and it has been possible for me to do my job from home, maybe then that conversation is reasonable. So it's about understanding that first. 
but also then having that conversation. So knowing that it's safe to have a conversation in your workplace and knowing who it is appropriate to go to. So usually it would be your own manager or particularly the HR department. And you'd be looking at, at having a conversation to say, I want to be able to do my job and I'm looking to see what reasonable accommodation is there to support me to do my job. The things that I need assistance with are X, Y and Z. And these are the things I've considered that would help me. It is also important to be aware of if somebody is experiencing a mental health difficulty and they are at a challenging time maybe they need to take time off and then it's a different conversation it's about having that conversation at work getting the time off taking the sick leave and then re-entering and doing your reasonable accommodation yeah. so there's a, there's a couple of different pieces yeah there. and the employer then having really good I suppose practicing policy in place around how to have those conversations and how to go down um you know the needs assessment to identify those reasonable accommodations so the yeah. employer um needs to be ready and 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 able to have those conversations as well and put those practical measures in place okay. exactly exactly and jane has just put in the um what the law means for your workplace so there are a couple of documents on our website where people can look from the employer or the employee perspective right, yeah, so that yeah. might be helpful as well brilliant thanks a million barbara and um, we've really enjoyed having you here this morning and your the this has been recorded and all um your links and resources will be sent out to all the attendees after after this morning so thank you we'd love you to stay for the rest of the webinar if you have time um okay um so i'm just <laughs> thanks a million i'm going to move on um and i can see caroline putting on her camera there um caroline McGrathy, who most of you are probably familiar with is the employment manager here at ahead um, and she um, work manages the WAM program, which I'm uh, working on. And we're going to do uh, about a 25, 30 minute presentation on the WAM program learnings. Um, so thanks for sharing your slides there, Caroline. So I think Caroline's going to start us off. Great. Um, good afternoon. It's past midday, so I can say good afternoon. And it's funny because I was looking in the chat and people were saying it was like torrential rain. And I was like, well, square I'm here. It's now just like, bucketing down now so apologies if you can hear the rain at my window and um, so it's good to see everyone and um, here today for our webinar and Barbara absolutely amazing presentation I always get to learn so much from Barbara anytime I watch her presentation so I suppose in terms of myself and gears of session and um, for the latter half of this webinar what we're going to be looking at and um, Deirdre alluded to earlier on was um, our learnings from the last two years, I suppose. So we did actually host a focus group with some of our graduates who were remote working during the pandemic. We selected evaluation from our graduates and uh, from managers as well that we'd like to share with you and also to share, I suppose, some learnings that we hope to take forward. So there's an outline here. So we're going to discuss the benefits and learnings of the last two years. We're then going to look at hybrid working going forward and consideration for employees with disabilities and some takeaways then at the end of the presentation. So I suppose I'm just going to start with this time, nearly this exact day, two years ago. So the 12th of March, um, there was an announcement by Leo Varadkar, who was the Taoiseach at the time. He was over in New York, if you remember, and he did a public service announcement and basically said that, you know, employers, you know, if your employees can work from home, please do so. So this is where I suppose all the workplaces, I, I remember even in a head, it was like Armageddon, it was like, what do we need to get? We need to get our laptop. Oh my God. You know, like it, it was just, you know, it was just even to think back, like that was two years ago and it feels like yesterday, to be honest, of that kind of rush to work from home. So since then, the majority of workplaces, particularly those that are admin based, have been working from home because of the government's announcement back then and the recommendation. But now that recommendation, I suppose, to work from home is gone and they are encouraging employees to return to the workplace. So I just wanted to kind of start off the presentation by sharing that screenshot um, of the video of Leo Varadkar speaking. And I kind of um, screenshotted the subtitles so it says, if you can, where, where possible, work from home. So I just thought that that's kind of, it, it's good perspective to kind of start the webinar this morning. So Deirdre, I think I'm handing over to you now. Yeah. And just to add to that, I think we all thought we were going to be home for three weeks um, and it's two years. That in the curve, wasn't it? 
yes, yes, flatten yeah. the curve. Um, so I suppose in terms of the WAM program, like all employers um, and programs of our places of work, we had to respond to that kind of immediate change in the workplace. Um, but the WAM program in particular had to get ready to, to respond to issues that would be arising from graduates that were currently on placements or placements that were starting to happen in the coming weeks um, after that announcement. And also to work with employers and to support them through that transition to remote working. So some of the things that the WAM program had to do was revise and redevelop the WAM needs assessment process. So just quickly to outline the, the needs assessment process is um, a process that we do a WAM with our graduates with disabilities going on placement to identify with them what reasonable accommodations or what workplace supports they need to undertake the role or the, the tasks of that role. So that was redevised and redeveloped to being on online. So prior to COVID, um, the WAM team would have went on site to the place of employment and done the needs assessment. And with COVID, we then had to start doing those needs assessments online and develop, I suppose, a whole suite of uh, documents and also process around that and that's been really successful and at the moment we're actually looking at re uh, revising it again to meet the hybrid working arrangements that will be in place going forward. Um, in terms of additional support for graduates one of the things that um, the WAM program did was usually on an annual basis prior to COVID there would have been a resilience day where all the graduates on placements across various employers would have come on site and had a, an event or a day with the WAM team. But because of COVID, we then put in place um, peer group um, meetings, which happened every three weeks, and they were hosted by, by the WAM team. Um, and I suppose the idea of them was to keep people connected um, with the program, but also to, um, with their peers. And it was a space to talk about kind of how their placement was going, any issues they were having, successes they were um, having, but also, I suppose, to reduce that isolation. Um, so things that would have come up would be kind of, you know, how induction and onboarding was going remotely, how they are interacting or engaging with their um, their team members, maybe how there wasn't a lot of work being allocated. And we kind of troubleshoot or, or brainstorm with them how they might approach um, approach that. But in, there were more kind of general disability related issues raised as well, like things around disclosure in the workplace around their disability. So there's a couple of quotes there in December um, last year, we did um, a survey with the grads that attended those um, meetings. And I suppose some of the, the benefits for them were reduced feeling of isolation due to working from home by coming to the meetings. And it was a safe space to discuss workplace issues with other graduates. Um, the webinars for employers, so these events were born out of, I suppose, the, um, the pandemic, and they've been hugely successful. Um, so prior to COVID, the WAM program would have run um, training events or networking events for employers that mostly that were engaged in the in the WAM program. But what we've seen with the webinars is that the uh, reach of these events um, has widened um, both across the country and ex to more external employers as well as those already engaged with the WAM program. And there was also a suite of remote working resources developed for employers and they're all online um, on the AHEAD website. So there's things like, you know, accessible features, um, information on video calling platforms, online meeting etiquette, and then virtual interviewing and onboarding and assistive technology. So they're all there if you, if you feel like having a look at them. So the last two years of WAM, so just a quick snapshot of um, what, what's happened for, for the program. We've advertised over 150 positions with 18 major employers and eight of them are actually new employers to the WAM program. So even with the pandemic, there were new employers coming um, and wanting to partner with WAM. So that's been really good. And then almost 400 graduates with disabilities have attended virtual interviews facilitated by employers. 
um, and 86% of WAM placements were fully remote. Um, and then the other percentage um, for some of those roles, because of the nature of the role, they were required to go on site. So for example, um, we work with pharmaceutical companies um, where roles would have been lab based or on the production line and they would have had to go on site. And then the other, a small number of people as the different stages of um, the government guidelines or public health guidelines um, evolved, some people or some graduates did actually go on site in a hybrid uh, working model. Brilliant. Um, so I suppose this is kind of this part of the presentation is looking at, I suppose, the benefits of remote working that we've seen from the last two years. So as Deirdre mentioned, we advertise over 150 positions and we placed about, uh, I think it's 80 something graduates off the top of my head um, during the pandemic. So it was fantastic to see employers were still recruiting and still willing to take that step to recruit graduates with disabilities in particular. What we found, the first section was jobs were a lot more accessible. It definitely widened up opportunities for our graduates with disabilities. And by that, what I meant was um, employers were now securing talent from across the country. So prior to COVID, sometimes employers would come to us and there would be a role based in Kerry, for example. There might not be a particular graduate with that qualification who is located in Kerry and has applied. So one of the quotes that we got from a, a WAM employer was, if the role had been wholly office-based, we wouldn't have been able to take the WAM graduates as we're based in Dublin and they live in rural Ireland. So remote working provided them with an opportunity. And it was an opportunity for that particular graduate to actually get work experience and to, I suppose, use that work experience to then look for other work. The other um, biggest thing that we saw was around commuting and public transport or lack of was not an issue. So, and this is kind of important in the context of disability because there are certain disabilities where it means that they cannot drive. So for example, if you are visually impaired or blind, maybe you have epilepsy um, or maybe it's dyspraxia, you know, and due to your disability, you cannot drive, you know? So you are heavily reliant on public transport. And sometimes employers have these big massive offices, maybe in an industrial park where there's no public transport to get you there, or there is, but it doesn't get you there on time for work. Um, so that was a, a remote working, definitely we didn't have to kind of look at that whole area of you know, commuting to the office. Another thing around commuting as well, there was one particular graduate who secured a placement in a neighboring county. And prior to COVID, if that, if that particular graduate had been required to physically go to the office, the commute was actually too long due to their disability. Their disability was a significant ongoing illness, which meant that, you know, commuting for more than kind of like 30 minutes drive would be quite tiring and taxing on their disability. So, you know, when the position came up in the neighboring county, that particular graduate was able to do that six months fully remote. So commuting and public transport were really important and in terms of people with disabilities getting employment. The other one that came out was there was less fears or worries about relocating and transferring their medical care. So, for example, in the past, we, there would be graduates who would love to work in this particular uh, location, but because of, I suppose, their medical needs. So, for example, they might have a psychiatrist, which they have to go to every three months. They have to go to their nurse to do their blood test, to pick up their medication. In order for them to take up a placement for six months and um, as usually what one placements are they would have to transfer you know find a psychiatrist find the nurse that would do all that for them in that particular county so there was less worries around transferring medical care because you could work from home so it meant that a lot of people were in a position to manage their disability better because of that so that was that's what it, the, around accessible jobs. I think it's really important that we can't forget the benefits that remote working has and, and hybrid working does have for people with disability. In terms of um, workplace accommodation, we found that um, obviously we placed over 80 graduates in the last two years or close to 90. Um, at the needs assessment process, really kind of, as Deirdre mentioned, we redeveloped that to look at both on-site and off-site. And what we did find for the majority of candidates, um, I suppose, the accommodations were actually less than had it been if they were on site. 
And not everybody, but the majority of the graduate day accommodations was left. So there was a reduction in workplace supports that employers have to provide. I suppose one thing, you know, accommodations that were once unrealistic, remote working, um, you know, have now become possible. And then again, as I mentioned, less adjustments or accommodations were requested uh, or recommended. The other kind of um, aspects of the whole kind of workplace support as the person was working from their own home, it was their, it was a controlled environment for them. It was their home. They can control the noise levels. They, if they have mobility issues, their home is going to be accessible for them. You know, so their home environment was a controlled environment in order to manage their disability. Disclosure decisions were different. So in February, uh, my colleague me posted a, a webinar on disclosure. And I suppose looked at that whole kind of deciding whether to disclose or whether not to. Um, because of remote working, there was, you know, people chose to disclose only certain things to managers. So one example I'll kind of pull out was around epilepsy. And, you know, if that person had been going into a physical workspace, they would have to disclose to their team because, you know, what to do in the event of a seizure. However, when they were working from home, they didn't need to disclose to their team, yes, maybe to their, their manager and to HR, but they, the whole team wouldn't need to know. So disclosure decisions were different, not just when you were in the workplace working, but also when you were going for an interview. So I remember one particular graduate I did a needs assessment with, and they had gone uh, through two steps of a video call interview with an employer. And this particular graduate actually had, um, I suppose, a mobility issue with their arm. And then when I was discussing this with the graduate and they were telling me around when they went for their third interview, which was actually on site, um, they realized that they'd never actually disclosed their disability to the employer. And they were worried about, you know, shaking, well, you couldn't shake the person's hand, but they were worried about what it may look like if, because they'd never disclosed their disability because they'd just done video interview. So disclosure decisions were often different than what they would have been if the person was going on site. I think Deirdre, I my hand over to you. Yep. So I guess um, we've all moved to um, online, various online platforms, and I suppose that was forced due to um, the pandemic and, and working remotely. But that was, has been a welcome, um, I suppose, change for many people with disabilities who have probably been asking for different um, ver or various um, technology platforms in the past. So it's meant the increased access for people with disabilities it, to the workplace and inclusion while they're in the workplace. So we've um, moved to new ways of communicating with colleagues. So you'll see a couple of icons there for MS Teams and Zoom, and we've also been using Skype. So those various platforms have opened up new ways of engaging with colleagues and one thing that we've heard a lot of is that instant messaging for graduates with disabilities um, starting placements that kind of um, way to engage informally with colleagues so it's less formal than an email you get a quicker response and you're building the kind of relationship while you're troubleshooting with them um, training has become more accessible so because a lot of tra all training is online now it's easier to engage with training so that professional development opportunity is there um, we also I suppose have recordings available so if people are not able to attend at it at the time that's that's also making training accessible and for many people I suppose with physical disabilities or um, other disabilities that, like Caroline said, travel or time commitments can, um, can impact on them, that availability of training online has made a huge difference for them and more available for them. Um, Auto-generated captions, so um, the I suppose that's hugely beneficial for, for people, but in particular, it's necessary for people that, that are deaf or that have hearing impairments. But we've also seen um, people that have maybe processing challenges find the closed captions or the, sorry, the auto-generated captions really helpful for them in meetings as well. So, and people with English as a second language, it can be beneficial for them. And I suppose, you know, that, 
we've now got a variety of ways of interacting with each other in meetings. So some people might be comfortable using their voice or being on camera and sharing so they can kind of react um, to, you know, comments or to information um, that people are giving in a meeting by liking or smiling or um, the, the various icons that we all use. I think I think this is important because, you know, with particular I suppose if you have a disability, say, for example, autism, you might find it difficult to, um, I suppose, kind of raise your hand at a team meeting where there's 10 other people and kind of say what you want to say. Whereas like when you're remote working, there's, you know, you can use the laugh and cry in face to react to someone or you can thumbs up or do the little celebration hands. And, you know, they're actually becoming more of an active participant in the meeting rather than a passive participant. So I think, you know, having that variety of ways of communicating and engaging is so important. And it definitely falls in line with the UDL principles, you know, multiple means of engagement, Deirdre, both myself and Deirdre did the UDL badge. So just um, promoting that if anyone wants to do it, but it is about offering that multiple ways um, of engagement and, and communicating with your colleagues. Yep. Thanks, Caroline. Um, so I guess it hasn't been all plain sailing and all all beneficial and there's definitely benefits. So one of the things that I suppose the focus group spoke about, but also um, the graduates that attended our regular check in meetings would have talked about is that incidental learning. So that's missing, I suppose, so that learning by osmosis or learning by being around your colleagues, listening and observing to what the rest of the team or the, uh, the wider organization are doing, you kind of don't get those quick tips. Um, and I suppose one of the, the hesitations that people um, had um, in or, or expressed was that they don't want to be bothering people or, or asking them lots of questions. So it's a lot, I suppose, harder to kind of just ask that question in the moment when you're sitting at home working remotely. So that's probably um, a, a space that we found people that were on placements were challenged by. So it's harder to ask questions and query simple tasks through remote working. And it's also harder to learn from a colleague solely from working online. So that was a quote from one of our graduates. Um, that missed social element of work. So I suppose you can't beat seeing people in person and being around people. You get energy and motivation from being around other people. You've got that kind of shared interest and that, um, that getting to know people. And one of the, the things that our graduates um, said, and it was echoed across lots of people, was that sadness that they started and finished a placement without actually meeting their managers and their colleagues. So, you know, that missed opportunity, even though they had plenty of time online with them, but just that, that real social connection face to face. Um, prolonged periods of isolation. So I suppose many people were working at home completely um, for their full placement. So that um, that isolation they would have experienced. And then many people with disabilities would have been cocooning even when we were other people were starting to go back out into society or they may have had a vulnerable family member at home. So they they would not have had an outlet outside of work either. So there was that isolation. So our meetings, we would have kind of um, seen that a lot of people were coming and feeling that that was their connection with other people outside of work as well, which is really good. Um, and we would have talked a lot about, you know, that self-care and your well-being while working at home and having boundaries around your start and finish time, um, the taking the breaks and getting out for fresh air and walks and things. Um, so some of the other things that our graduates would have expressed is that hindered professional um, growth. So I suppose the value of interacting with people in person, but also that kind of there's more opportunities when you're on site to demonstrate your skills and your talents. Um, and for your colleagues or your manager to see what you're doing um, and you can kind of get involved in more projects or more work outside of your your job description I suppose as well and one of the things that um, our graduates would have said is that because they weren't visible or they weren't seen by their manager or their colleagues they felt they had to prove themselves in the workplace so they might have um, you know worked longer hours um, to do that so I suppose that that's um, was a challenge for many people. Then resolving IT issues and the installation of assistive technology. So this was a point of stress and nervousness for a lot of our graduates, and in particular, those people that were reliant on assistive technology to undertake their role. 
So working remotely, I suppose you didn't have that ease of resolving IT issues be, by being on site and connecting in with the IT team. Many people might have had experience of working with online platforms. So in our needs assessment process, we would have talked a lot about that. You know, have you worked remotely? Um, have you used platforms like Teams or Zoom and kind of talking through what supports they might need in, in working remotely for that? Thanks, Caroline. Might move to the next one. Oh, relationship. Sorry, I missed the last one. Relationship um, building and networking. I suppose that's probably coming through all the other points that that missed opportunity when you're working remotely to do that. So there's a couple of um, graduate experience comments here. So at the end of our placements, we always send um, an evaluation to the graduate who's on placement, the their mentor and their manager. So these are just some of the comments that were um, that came through. So in particular around that remote working. So I really enjoyed remote working from an accessibility standpoint. It was great and I took, think it took a lot of pressure off. I did not attend the office. There I would be able to network and get more work. And remote working helped me manage my disability better in most aspects of the work and not in others. And then just also some managers perspectives, I suppose, on managing graduates um, in that remote um, arrangement. So if we could have met in person during the placement, it would have been beneficial for the graduate and for the team, but that was not possibly possible because of COVID-19. So I know a lot of our employers, in particular the managers, were also sad that they couldn't meet the graduates, especially when graduates were, you know, performing so well in the roles and had contributed so much to, to the work of the team and, and they kind of didn't get to see them in person. So the graduate was used to working remotely, so there were no issues around this and they managed to settle into the team and build good working relationships. We tried as much as possible to ensure that the graduate got a successful experience of social interaction with the team, in addition to just being managed remotely. And finally, the blended working arrangement during their tenure allowed the main briefings to be done as a face to face and meant work is more easily completed remotely. So I guess that kind of leads into the hybrid working model that there's benefits to being on site and getting that kind of induction and that training, but then also being able to work remotely on the day to day. So, Caroline, we might just launch or, or Jade, sorry, we might launch a quick poll for the audience um, at this point. So we're just getting um, a sense of, I suppose, in your company going forward, what's going to be happening. So the options will be, um, will you be returning to on-site work? Will it be a remote working arrangement? Will it be hybrid work? Or you don't know yet. You can see all the answers now coming in, Deirdre. We have 78 people on the call today. I think a couple of people have to drop off. Yeah. We had about 90 earlier on, I think. So yeah, a few people have messaged say they've to go. Okay. A few more answers coming in. Okay, so it's looking like hybrid work is is definitely the way of the, the future for 70, 78% of the people here. Um 13% don't know yet, 7% will be on site, and then 2% will be remote work. Um, so I guess, you know, the hybrid working is probably the preference of a lot of em employees. And I know employers are working around plans to, to um, I suppose, put that hybrid working model in place. So we just quick definition here of what hybrid working is. Um, at its core, hybrid working, often confused with the umbrella term flexible work, encompasses the concept of supporting employees to do work in the office and remotely. So I suppose in terms of, you know, we've talked about the learnings um, that the WAM program have, um, I suppose, gathered over our last two years of graduates getting placements remotely and working and supporting employers with that remote work. Um, and we've seen the huge benefits of that, but we've also seen that it's it's there can be challenges and there can be things missed by being um, wor working at home as well. So not all employees with disabilities want to work remotely. The majority want a balance. 
so there are positives to a hybrid model. I suppose we, we talk a lot about uh, the visibility of disability and the openness about, you know, talking about disability and working with colleagues that have disabilities and what we learn from those people and what they contribute to the team. And I suppose how it often opens up the doors for people that might have invisible disabilities or they might be comfortable talking about their disability to come forward and talk about it. So we don't want that kind of to be missed either or also that, you know, people with disabilities that Oh, working at home is, you know, a fix to the challenges that happen in the workplace. So because it's not, it's really about getting that balance and getting the opportunity to work on site. But if for all the different reasons we've talked about to now, there are times where it's better to work at home or it's um, it, it, the person's better able to manage the disability that there is that option for that hybrid working. Um, I suppose also that there's opportunities for, for professional growth um, and networking. And we've talked about why that's important. The, there's a better work-life balance for people with um, disabilities by that hybrid working model. So for example, people that have mental health conditions, and we've had a recent graduate tell us that they have worked in on site um, on a WAM placement and, and currently working remotely on a work placement. And due to the nature of their disability, which is a mental health condition, they are finding the remote working extremely beneficial to them. And the fact that they can go back to the office and hybrid working, um, that is not creating them any anxiety. Whereas if they were going back on site, that person has said that, you know, they would find that very stressful. Um, the, the commute, the being in the office and being around people, the not having as much flexibility in terms of being able to go to appointments and to do that self-care piece that Barbara talked about earlier as well. So they've said that, you know, if it was a fully um, on-site work placement, they may not still be in the placement that um, for that reason. Sorry, Caroline, did you want to add something there? No, I was just going okay. to go into the next slide here and just conscious of time here. Just yep. So I suppose I just wanted to kind of tell the audience about my own personal needs assessment. Um, so most of you do know that I am deaf, so I'm a bilingual deaf person that wears hearing aids. Um, so I, I use both my language and I obviously speak and I hear. So this is just a kind of on the screen here, I've got um, in the first kind of box there, on-site uh, workplace recommendations that I would have typically used in the past. So I would have had a desk that was in an appropriate location. So what I mean by that is my back would be against the wall and people, so I could see people walk up to me. Um, I would have had a personal emergency evacuation plan, you know, in the event of a fire, um, because uh, just I suppose because of the nature of my disability, it is a health and safety consideration. Um, during team meetings, I would have always had to sit at the head of the table, uh, which was a bit intimidating um, at the start because that was my accommodation and I felt like I was always chairing the meeting, but it was literally because I needed to see people's faces. So th in order for me to do that, it was better I sit at the head of the table rather than in a big long row of people speaking one at a time so people kind of not over you know laughing with each other I would have had ISL interpreters for larger meetings so typically any conferences or training I would have attended in the past and I suppose just a general awareness of my disability um, as well when I was um, meeting people kind of physically in terms of when I I suppose remote working and um, if I had started with a head fully remote, I would have only required three accommodations. I would have only required caption for a video call. So we use MS Teams that has a live auto-generated caption feature, um, speaking one at a time. And I think we all have to do that when we're online videos because you just can't talk over one another because it's, it's, it's a 2D kind of environment. So speaking one at a time was really important using the raise hand function. Um, and then having my own, like I mentioned, alluded to earlier on, a controlled environment. So I need to be in a quiet place in my home where I can actually control the audio on my computer. So I can have the volume up as high as I want. So if I started in a head during the pandemic, I would have only required three accommodations. Whereas I suppose I started nine years ago and there was a longer list of accommodations. So you can see there that, you know, reduced workplace accommodations were a thing. But in terms of 
hybrid model where in a head we're planning to go back to a hybrid model or to, to do a hybrid model and I've kind of done my own little needs assessments uh, on myself so I would have to do most of my video calls at home um, because I can't wear headphones because of my hearing aid. Now I have got fancy new hearing aids that have Bluetooth functionality but the problem is it doesn't work with the laptop. So another alternative would be that I would have access to a device that has that capability to link with my hearing aid where I can stream audio and then I can have my video calls done in the office. But when I go back to a hybrid model, I will be making sure that I schedule my video calls on the days that I'm at home. The other kind of on-site recommendation there for the desk, that, that will all still be applicable. Um, but it's, it's kind of looking at it in the lens of a hybrid model and now we're going forward with new video calling facilities and stuff like that. So that was just my own personal example of my on-site recommendations, my a remote setting, and I suppose the hybrid setting. It is combining the two and I suppose it's looking at ways that we can kind of accommodate the video calling more appropriately. So I think there's, there's another example here we have of an autistic graduate. Yeah, so um, I suppose the the workplace accommodations that you see on the uh, left hand column, there are left box and the blue box. There are kind of some typical um, workplace accommodations that someone with autism would would request. So clear direction and thorough explanation of work tasks, follow verbal instruction with written summary. So the, the manager or whoever setting the task to follow up with a written um, instruction to give clear kind of timelines or deadlines and give advance notice of meetings and give specific feedback. Um, so just really quickly, um, the, we've just done a comparison of somebody who had a placement um, on site and a remote placement, and you get to see the kind of differences in their workplace accommodation. So like Caroline said, um, for the on site, it's a new environment. So you know that uh, getting adjusting and getting used to them, people with autism, um, I suppose are autistic people, they like that structure and that understanding and familiarity of, you know, where they're going and what they're doing. So in a new environment that can, that can be quite challenging or stressful for them. So in the home or working remotely, they're in their own environment and, and it's much more familiar. They've got their own setup um, in terms of what they need or what helps reduce maybe some of those sensory stimulations for them. So the sensory challenges on site, um, some of the things that um, autistic people might request are like a designated quiet space, being able to take breaks um, away from the office, having um, the opportunity to wear noise cancelling headphones. Um, and then I suppose social interaction and reading social cues can be challenging for autistic people. And in the office, you know, there's a lot more of that and it's it's constant. Whereas when they're at home, there's less social interaction. And it's um, so it's it's po a positive for them and it reduces that stress level because they've got a smaller colleague circle to get to know. And they know when they're logging on to to meet people or to connect with people because it's more scheduled than when they're in the office. Sorry, I was just trying to find my mute button there. I was like, it disappeared. Um, so I actually think there was a, a thing in the chat there about the right to request remote work. So you probably have been aware, um, I think it was January and February, there's currently a bill going through, um, I suppose, the doll at the minute around the request to remote work. So this is really kind of looking at building on the last two years um, of COVID-19 and remote working. And it wants to try and make remote working a tournament option um, in Ireland. And it gives all employees a legal or, or a legal right to request remote working. But I suppose there are um, in the, the bill itself, there is kind of certain different exceptions that employers can refuse a, a request to remote work. And as Barbara alluded to earlier on, you know, if the job is I suppose, a customer facing role or, you know, that probably can't be done remotely, you know. But I suppose what does the bill mean for employees with disabilities? So I might just kind of, um, I'm not going to spend too long on this, and I know ahead are interested in kind of, I suppose, seeing what more can be done on this, but I suppose what, what's really important, what really stood out for us in terms of, of ahead was the bill actually doesn't specify that employees can request remote working as a reasonable accommodation under the Employment Equality Act. 
So in the Employment Equality Act, there's different kind of examples of what employers can do um, to provide reasonable accommodation, such as redistribution of tasks, time off for medical appointments. But I know that there's been a review of the Equality Act, which AHEAD has already submitted to um, in terms of the public consultation. Um, but the bill doesn't seem to reflect, I suppose, the kind of reasonable accommodation aspect that it can be considered a reasonable accommodation. So that was one of the things that stood out to us quite quite a lot. The other second thing is requests can only be made once they have completed 26 weeks continuous service. So that's six months. But I suppose this could actually prevent people from taking up uh, employment in the company in the first instance, you know, if they can't actually request that, you know, from the very beginning. So I suppose there are a couple of um, not things wrong, but I suppose there could be more done in terms of that bill. And I know ahead are interested again, as I say, kind of in kind of submitting to it in, in some way and kind of to share the learning. But um, I suppose that's just a few of the main things that kind of stood out to us um, from that bill. And I suppose even there is a request to remote work bill, but that means it doesn't mean that your company actually can't do more than what the bill says. You know, like the bill is for well, the, the minimum requirements, but you know, always aim high, go further than what the bill is it says. So I think Deirdre, you're going to take this one. Or is it me? Me? Yeah. Yeah, two years on. Yeah. So I suppose we we share kind of all the good positives and learnings from I suppose the last two years, certainly in terms of the WAM program and our work with, with employers. And um, we, we really can't forget the benefits that it has. We can't forget forget the benefits of actually access, accessing and entering employment in the first instance. As I said, people were able to take up employment that they may have never been able to do so in the past. And I think it's really, really important that we recognize that and employers are still secure in talent from all around the country. The second thing to be mindful of is that, as I mentioned, disclosure decisions were different. Um, I don't know what have I disclosed, you know, um, in terms of my own disability, if I was starting a new job in a pandemic, because I would be able to manage my disability better. But I suppose you could have new hires in the past two years that may have not disclosed their disability because they never needed to. So I think we need to recognize that and make sure that we are opening up, up the conversations um, when you're bringing employees back and communicating, you know, if you have a disability do you require any reasonable accommodation, you know, to make sure that that opportunity is there for disclosure for new people who've joined. And then I suppose the other thing is that employers may, employees may have acquired a new disability um, in the last two years, um, maybe mental health, maybe an ongoing illness. So again, it's about creating that opportunity for disclosure when you're going back into the office. This is you, you Deirdre, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's Perfect. me. So I guess just to finish up, you know, the, the return to the office has been kind of named the great office return. And you'll, you'll see there, Barbara made mention earlier around the kind of social cues and the things um, that will be different going forward. So you'll see the elbows up there. So one of the things we've talked about is, you know, will there be a handshake again in the future? So that's just a nice little icon of that. So I suppose what it what it means for employers really in that that returning to the office create opportunities for disclosure so we've talked at many different events around how you can do that so it's things like having a clear of policy and procedure for someone if they disclose so that that awareness of you know there is a, a contact person within the organization and there is a, a procedure if you want to disclose or talk about your disability um, so try and ask at various opportunities as well and I think Barbara from Sea Change gave some really good tips around how you can kind of um, be supporting and having conversations with your with your staff or your colleagues going back to work. Um, so just if you want to move to the next one, Caroline, as well. Thank you. So consult with employees prior to their return inform them what, what supports your company can offer. So I know there is kind of a planning phase and it's not 100% yet what's happening in every employment place, but as much as you can be communicating and consulting with your, with your staff um, and letting them know what is happening and what are the options. And then 
like Caroline said there, maybe to consider remote working as a reasonable accommodation um, and I suppose be open to that and open to having those conversations and looking at what the benefits have been for people, but also what are the reasons why they would be coming into the office and being really clear around that. Um, and I guess just to say thank you and welcome back to work in whatever way you're going back. Um, and if you have any questions, we can take a few now. There was one in there around the what, what is the remote working bill, but I think someone might have answered that. If not, we'll send, send the link on to you. Thanks for popping on your camera as well, Barbara. Um, so I'm just going to, I don't think we have any questions, just lots of comments around that they people have enjoyed um the event hang on we have one here maybe one point for many companies oh sorry that's dara is it sorry to her for many companies who have been working off-site for the last two years it's very difficult to argue that hybrid remote workplace as is not a reasonable accommodation or that it would place a disproportionate burden on employers um, which is the language that's used in the employment legislation. So in essence, although it's not specifically stated that remote working is a reasonable accommodation under the law, um, it is something that should be considered. So I guess, yeah, that, that's the point that we were trying to talk about there is that, you know, it is really that consultation and talking to people about the benefits and how it can work going forward. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's an exciting time for sure. I mean, even ourselves in the head, um, you know, these webinars, they've been absolutely fantastic in reaching a national audience, but few people want in-person events again for networking. So um, we don't have a date for our next webinar um, because we are still figuring out that ourselves. Um, but we, we hope to have a blended approach going forward where we have in-person events that kind of focus more on the networking and kind of still have our webinars to reach a more and in general awareness training. So um, keep an eye on our website and most of you have already signed up for the webinar mailing list. So you will get that. So as soon as we know, we will let everybody know. Um, and as always, we kind of appreciate your feedback. So Jade's going to pop a, a survey link into the chat there and we'll also um, send that out with the links after and the presentation slides. And we do encourage you to, to kind of give us feedback because we're learning and wanting to, to, to develop these webinars. And like Caroline said, look at what we can do going forward as we go back into the workplace. So once again, thank you to Barbara Brennan from Sea Change. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you here today. And I know I picked up lots of information and tips from you so thank you and all her resources will be available as well and also to Michelle from, um, from PCR who's been doing the live captions for us today thank you Michelle and um, you have an amazing skill so well done um, and I, um, I think that's it from us so thanks everybody and we'll see you next time bye <clears throat> thanks so much bye Barbara